The Tom Woods Show, episode 979. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, we are inching toward the 1,000th episode of The Tom Woods Show, and I'd like you to join me for it at a special event in Orlando, September 9th. Featuring Michael Malice and Tom DiLorenzo as special guests and the great Eric July as MC. It's absolutely free, but you got to register. Check it out at TomWoods.com slash Orlando. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. Here's an episode a bit off the beaten path. We're going to talk today about Liechtenstein, a very, very small country, certainly population-wise, but a very, very interesting country, as I think you'll agree after you hear this conversation, just because of, well, a lot of things, economic liberty, the usual sorts of things, but I don't want to give it away. When you hear the political ideas of the monarch, you're going to be shocked. It's the closest thing you've ever had to a libertarian ruler. And you say, Woods, I don't believe you. Well, hang on, just Will you just wait a minute? Because it's a very, very interesting topic. And joining us to talk about it is Andreas Cole, who is the director of the Self-Determination Institute, which he's just getting started. He's also a council member at the Foundation for the Advancement of Liberty, or fundalib.org. And if you'd like to visit that in English, it would be fundalib.org slash en. It's located in Spain. And... Let's see, we'll have his Twitter, so you can tweet out to him what a great guy he is if you like. We'll have a bunch of interesting things at tomwoods.com slash 979. Andreas, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Tom. I've had some interest in uh, Liechtenstein among my listeners for a while, but I have not been able to get anybody on the show with any knowledge of the subject. And then I read the text of your talk on this, and I thought, Perfect. This is a perfect. Uh, in fact, I think somebody actually sent it to me. A listener sent it to me and said, "All right, was now you have no excuse anymore not to talk about Liechtenstein." Here's a guy who knows about it. So, tell me in sixty seconds. Uh, just give me background as to why the example of Liechtenstein is of particular interest. Because I bet a lot of people, even who listen to this show, don't realize what's so extraordinary about it. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, just in 60 seconds, I would say that uh, it's uh, an absolute monarchy with uh, a monarch who's absolutely and, and radically libertarian. And um, really what's so unique about Liechtenstein uh, is from its 2003 constitutional amendment, which uh, gave every single village in the country the right of secession. I think that's totally unprecedented. That is totally unprecedented. Now, the population of the entire country is apparently 38,000. Very, very small, although with very low population density. You point out that Monaco is roughly similar and is 80% smaller geographically. So we're dealing with a very small place, and we're dealing with a place in which the villages have substantial autonomy. Mm -hmm. In fact, say something about the ability of a village to propose a, a referendum. Yeah, so um, in order to start a local referendum, you only need the signatures of 5% of uh, the local eligible voters. So in the smallest village of Planken, uh, this actually means uh, there's 280 eligible voters. This actually means that you only need a handful of signatures uh, to start any sort of local referendum, including on independence. So do you know for any examples of the kinds of referendums that have passed or been proposed? Um, well, usually the most uh, um, common kind of local village level referendum uh, is usually to give someone in the village uh, citizenship. So um, Liechtenstein has one of the longest naturalization uh, processes in the world. You actually need to live in the country for 30 years before you get citizenship. Whoa. Unless you live in the same village for 10 years. Uh, and then your local community can have a, a vote on giving you citizenship. Wow. Well, that's quite an interesting policy, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's uh, in order to promote uh, local integration into the community. Um, it's a it's a very kind of family driven uh, culture. And um, of course, this means that they're quite careful about who they let in. 
Well, tell me about the philosophy. Uh, well, first of all, what is the name of the, the, I guess the prince is in charge now, it de facto. Uh, tell me how this, that, that, that works. And then I want to know their actual philosophy. They're mm-hmm. doing this on purpose because they believe in something. Yeah. So um, I, I'll explain the political system of Liechtenstein a little bit. It's uh, quite unique as well. Um, you have an absolute monarchy that's basically completely sovereign um, and has absolute power to legislate. Um, there is also a parliament, and in practice, it might seem like the parliament and the monarchy have uh, basically the same power, although the monarchy at the end of the day can veto the parliament and can dissolve the parliament, uh, which makes it more powerful. Um, there is then also direct democracy. So at the national level, you need a thousand signatures to start a referendum or 1500 if you want to change the constitution. Um, these referendums always supersede uh, and override the parliament, um, but the the prince can veto uh, a popular referendum unless it's one of two different types of referendums. If you, if you start a referendum to get rid of the current prince um, and then the princely family has to elect a new prince, or if you start a referendum to get rid of the princely family, abolish the monarchy altogether, then um, then in these two cases, the prince would not be able to veto. Then, then afterwards, there's an additional layer, uh, which is local governance, uh, because every single village has a law of autonomy. So, uh, for example, the, uh, the national income tax in Liechtenstein is 1.2%. But the average person pays uh, an average about 17.8% income tax because the rest is levied at the local village level. So, yeah, um, right now the the current prince is Prince Hans Adam II. But in Liechtenstein, the powers of the reigning prince aren't transferred to the son um, upon the death of, uh, of the prince. Uh, what they do instead is that uh, the regent actually gets handed um, the power sometime, sometime before so that he can kind of learn on the job. So the current regent is Prince Alois, who effectively rules the country, even though his father uh, has the, the ultimate say. Now, how is it possible that it can't just be the case that the ruling family happens to be ideologically a certain way? The people would presumably also have to be on board for this. So Mm -hmm. how do we account for the fact that there just happens to be such a concentration of people who feel a certain way in this one place, given that everybody seems to feel the exact opposite way in the rest of the world? Yeah, well, that's a question I've asked myself a lot. Um, I think there's a lot of factors um, to be considered. On one hand, the princely family's uh, ideological convictions resonate very strongly throughout the population of Liechtenstein, and uh, that has a lot to do with the legacy that the princely family has. Uh, um, they've always been very benevolent, very charitable uh, rulers. Um, Liechtenstein used to be a very poor country. Uh, nowadays, it's uh, it's known as being one of the wealthiest countries in the world, but they, they only really got their wealth um, in the late 60s, early 70s. Throughout most of history, Liechtenstein was a very poor farming, uh, agrarian community. Um, and they, ha- they, they had a lot of famines, um, which the princely family answered by, by selling a lot of their own assets just to feed the country. Um, so that's, uh, that's a factor that uh, contributes to the people really um, caring about what the princely family think and, and really looking up to them as, uh, as, as leaders natural leaders. Um, Another factor, I think, has to be time preference. So I I think most of uh, your viewers uh, will be familiar with time preference, but just in case, um, having a a high time preference typically means that you prefer present satisfaction even at high future costs, whereas a low time preference means that you prefer future satisfaction, maybe even cross-generational satisfaction, even at higher present costs. So um, I, I think Liechtenstein has um, a culturally imbued low time preference, probably the lowest in the world uh, or amongst uh, the, the lowest. And historically, one of the reasons for that is that Liechtenstein geographically lies on a very 
inhospitable uh, area is uh, on on the bed of the the Rhine River and just below uh, very tall alpine peaks. So the river before dams were built used to overflood very regularly and destroy everything in the valley. And they also used to get a lot of avalanches that would destroy everything. So you can imagine the constant destruction from below and from above. Um, they had to develop their culture in the context of constant uh, destruction and reconstruction, which means that they had to have a lot of foresight and and uh, be the kind of people that save a lot of resources for the future. I think there's uh, there's uh, an undeniable correlation between lower time preferences and more libertarian kind of uh, political outlooks. One thing that's been interesting to me is I just happen to know that Prince Hans Adam has had good relations with Hans Hermann Hoppe, who's a great uh, libertarian theorist, uh, has a lot of enemies in the U.S. who've never read a single word he's written. Mm -hmm. But he's he's absolutely brilliant, and, and I will I will hear no uh, disagreement on that score. And, and apparently they had some work together on uh, the prince's uh, recent book on the manuscript. So t t tell me about that and tell me about this book, because apparently it's it's rather an overlooked uh, libertarian work. Yeah, so um, Hoppe told me that uh, Prince Hans Adam invited him to the princely castle uh, a handful of times, and Hoppe did indeed uh, edit the manuscript for The State in the Third Millennium. Now, The State in the Third Millennium is uh, a really fascinating book to me. Um, it isn't um, exactly the kind of Austrian literature a lot of us are, are used to. Um, the Prince describes it as um, a sort of political cookbook um, of um, recipes uh, gathered throughout generations in his family. But actually, I'd, I'd like to read you one of uh, the, the uh, a quote from the, one of the very first few pages in the book where he describes um, the goal of his book. And it, it, this has actually become one of my own personal goals as well. So I quote, I would like to set out in this book the reasons why the traditional state as a monopoly enterprise not only is an inefficient enterprise with a poor price performance ratio, but even more importantly, becomes more of a danger for humanity the longer it exists. And that's, that's a very powerful quote. This is a head of state, a recognized, legitimate sovereign, saying that the state as a monopoly enterprise is a danger for humanity. That is rather an extraordinary statement from anybody, but in particular from a head of state. So given that he's said that, how is that view manifested in Liechtenstein? There, there certainly aren't competing defense agencies in Liechtenstein. So what does he really mean by that? Sure. Um, well, actually... By abolishing the monopoly of the state, you don't necessarily introduce competition. What you do would be, what you are actually doing is introducing the potential for competition. But there aren't any competing governance agencies in Liechtenstein simply for the reason that there is no demand for a, a competitor. Everybody is uh, so satisfied with the service of uh, the current government of Liechtenstein that um, there, it would be unviable to try to, to start a competing agency. It, would, it, just, it wouldn't be legally impossible. It would just, uh, there would just be no market demand for it. So actually, the, when the prince gave the right of um, secession to every village in 2003, this was after a pretty hectic uh, argument with a lot of um, his opposition in the country because he initially wanted to give that, this right of secession not just to every village, but also to every individual and their private property. Yeah, that's a, that too is quite an extraordinary thing. I, I, I mean, we've never seen, I've never heard of anybody anywhere who's ever been in charge of anything politically advance an idea like that. Yeah, and, you know, I think it's such a shame that, uh, that, that this, whole, uh, this whole constitutional affair has been overlooked by libertarians. We, we should have been on it. Uh, this was back in 2003. I wasn't really in the movement yet. I was very young. But there wasn't anyone really recording this or keeping track of it from a libertarian perspective that there was actually a head of state trying to implement anarcho-capitalism. I mean, how amazing is that? And how uh, what a shame it is that, that uh, nobody has actually really heard of it. 
in your talk, you say, I'm going to be telling you about this wonderful and, and fascinating place, but at the same time, don't move there. Well, what did you mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is um, that Liechtenstein, even though it is the ultimate expression of, uh, of libertarianism, I don't think any country in the world uh, has implemented libertarianism to the extent uh, Liechtenstein has. It's also a very conservative uh, culture that's uh, very careful about letting new people in. Uh, they're very, they can be skeptical of foreigners. Um, it's it's a high trust uh, society with uh, very high in group preferences, if that makes any sense. Um, I I don't think it is viable for libertarians to try to move there, uh, especially because uh, immigration policies won't uh, won't allow us. But also because I don't think we'd be welcomed at all. We'd be seen as trying to change something that's already that's already perfect. And I think the cause of liberty is too great for us to. Uh, abandon it in our respective countries. And that's not saying that people in, in uh, under oppressive regimes shouldn't try to get away. Just saying that uh, while we are still able to stay in our own respective countries and uh, not put ourselves in, in any significant danger by doing so, I think the, the cause of liberty, the fight of liberty itself, will be much more benefited by us uh, staying there and, uh, and trying to, to, to change things within our own communities, which is where the, we have the biggest leverage. Now, this is a question that's going to show that you and I have never met before, but where do you live? <laughs> well, r right now, uh, yes. So this will sound a little bit hypocritical from for me because uh, I'm actually trying to emigrate to Liechtenstein right uh -huh. now. <laughs> right now, I live I live right on on the border on the Austrian side. I still haven't gotten a, a Liechtenstein uh, residency permit. And this is this is a process that will probably take all of my life. Uh, you now, uh, integrating into this uh, local community, they have a very strong local dialect that you can't really learn on the internet or anywhere else. Uh, but it's something that I've decided for myself because, because I don't have a strong, uh, any strong roots anywhere. Um, I am, I come from a very multicultural family. I have four citizenships. Um, and I just, I just didn't feel like I had any strong attachments anywhere. And, um, that, that that's something that if you have it, I think you should, uh, really, really grab onto it. So it's a it's a wealthy place in terms of uh, per capita income, uh, GDP, productivity. It has a diverse base of uh, employment. That is to say, there's industry, there's agriculture, there's financial sector. Uh, it's it's not any one thing, and you have this self governance really on the part of of villages up to the point of possible secession mm -hmm. and then in terms of taxation and other uh i mean you did mention briefly taxation but other forms of economic liberty we're presuming that it comes out pretty well yeah it does um especially in terms of regulations um a lot of regulations are are done at, at the local level um and Liechtenstein has actually become uh, has become a, a hotspot for all kinds of um niche manufacturing and um i think i, I read somewhere that it has um the highest rate of um, of uh, research and development uh maybe per capita in, in in the world wow very interesting all right so if we want to find out more about this we probably should read the state in the third millennium the the book that you mentioned earlier that that came out in 2009 and and so i'm going to link to that book at tomwoods.com 979 and you can be sure that you're going to be reading a book almost none of your libertarian friends probably none of them have ever heard of much less read but how unique it, that book is as you say uh, quite unique indeed and then i'm also going to link to the talk you gave on this subject which is a nice pre of what it's like to well, I suppose what it's like to live in Liechtenstein from a political point of view, but just overall, you get the impression that this is a, a diamond in the rough. This is an amazing place, and in a way, it's almost as if they want to – you can understand why somebody would want to keep this the, the best-kept secret in the world. I, I wouldn't necessarily 
either want to deal with a bunch of American libertarians at the time, <laughs> you know, moving into my country. Get the heck out of here. Who are you people? But uh, anyway, tell me about your own website bef- uh, before we go, what, what that is. Yeah. Um, so I, I work at a think tank in Spain called the Foundation for the Advancement of Liberty. But I'm also uh, starting my own think tank right now called uh, the Self-Determination Institute that doesn't have a website yet. Um, but the goal of this uh, of uh, this new institute will be to promote the ideas of self-determination as uh, explained by by Prince Hans Adam and, and his own um, general uh, p- uh, political philosophy. One of our first works will be a self-determination index that will rank uh, c- uh, countries worldwide by how much they respect the right of self-determination. Obviously, Liechtenstein will come first. Um, but yeah, it, just a shout out so you can uh, look out for this uh, index, which I think will be uh, pretty powerful. Okay, very very interesting. So I'm going to I'll we'll link to what your to to the your, uh, the Spanish think tank you work for. Get all this stuff up mm-hmm. at tomwoods.com/979. All right, well thanks for doing this. Uh, it's um, kind of nice to have good news once in a while. <laughs> it's a, there there are 38,000 happy people in the world and that's uh, 38,000 more than I was aware of before today. So thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Tom. All right, that'll do it for us today. Next week, I've got a couple of guests coming on by popular demand. People who in my supporting listeners group have been on the list. Get these people on, Woods. Well, I've finally done it. So I can't tell you who they are. That would suck all the life out of the show. But you're going to enjoy them. If you are enjoying this show uh, and you want to stick it to all the bad guys... Join me as a supporting listener over at supportinglisteners.com, and just one of the benefits you get is membership in our secret group, the Tom Woods Show Elite. But you also get transcripts of the interviews that I do and many, many, many other benefits. Wait till you see the benefits waiting for you at supportinglisteners.com, because I love you. You support the show, I love you. People I love get nice things, okay? So you're going to get some nice things over at supportinglisteners.com. Thanks for listening. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.